line drawn right there in chapter 12 because uh, as we talked about, there's a logical division there. All the things that happen up until this chapter, uh, they've now concluded, they've come to a conclusion, you know, without a whole lot of details about the millennial kingdom and all that, but it's kind of come to a conclusion. And then chapter 12 seems to start a new section where we see a lot of these things uh, being talked about again. So last time we were in this series and we came to chapter 12, we talked about the uh, two forces at work, both in heaven and on earth. And of course, that would be the seed of Satan versus the seed of the woman or the seed of Christ uh, is a basic idea there. And they're at enmity one with another. Always will be at enmity until the, uh, in, until the conclusion of all these different things. So uh, if you look back at chapter 12, in verse 2, uh, actually verse 3, it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. The first wonder was the woman that it talked about. And then this one it talks about, uh, And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. So you see there the dragon, and then uh, in chapter 13, as he just read, we see the introduction of this beast that was mentioned one time so far, but it didn't really give little details to it. A beast, and then a second beast, right? And then, uh, so you've heard the word, it doesn't actually use this word, but you've heard the word false prophet. Yeah. You've heard the word antichrist. Uh, and in times prophecy, you hear all these words, and you start to think, well, how do I plug these all in? Who's what? You know, what is, what is what? So you ask the average person, maybe even a basic understanding of Bible and prophecy, and you say, well, who is the beast? Who is the false prophet? And you ask this, and it gets kind of confusing as you're reading these things. And so what I want to preach about uh, this afternoon is simply just kind of clarifying from chapter 13 who these key characters are in this story. The dragon the beast, and the false prophet. Now, I do not believe that uh, when this, if you see in verse, uh, go back to chapter 12 again, verse 5, uh, it says, uh, or actually verse 7, there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not, neither was a place found anymore for them, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Now, I don't believe that this has taken place yet. Now, it looks like you think, well, of course Satan has been kicked out of heaven. You know, yeah, but we see him in the Bible as the accuser of the brethren, still somehow going before uh, God, accusing the brethren, and there's some kind of access there. I don't completely understand it. But at this time, which I believe is right before what we know as the Great Tribulation, uh, we see uh, him being kicked out, and he knows his time is short. And so uh, we see this uh, key character. So the first one we're going to talk about then is this character, the dragon. I'm, I'm saying character and story. You understand this is a real, this is, these are real events. It's not a fairy tale. But, uh, but as it's told here in this narrative, these are the key players. Okay, first of all is the dragon. And uh, we saw it in, uh, the, in, in verse 2 of chapter 12. Uh, going after, or verse 3 right there, going after the woman and trying to uh, uh, destroy the seed of the woman. Look at chapter 9 once again. Notice it says that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So you have, who is the dragon? Well, it makes it pretty clear, doesn't it? I mean, there's no way of getting around this. Who's the dragon? The old serpent, and he's called the devil and Satan, and he deceived the whole world. I mean, we know who this guy is. We've seen him all throughout the Bible, right? Now look at chapter 20. Same thing. We see the description. Chapter 20, verse 2. And he laid hold on that dragon, on the dragon, the, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So, uh, again, this description tells us who it is. And, uh, and I believe the dragon and the serpent. Now, here's a little interesting thing. Go back to Genesis 3, if you will. I believe the dragon and the serpent. I'm sure I've mentioned this before. I'm not sure if it was in this series or not. But I believe this is talking about the same animal. <laughs> that, same, the, that same animal, if you will. Chapter 3, verse 14. 
And the Lord God said unto the serpent, all right, this is after, you know, he said the serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field. And after uh, he's deceived Eve and, and then Adam followed, uh, followed suit, he says, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above the all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. I remember I was in a Christian school for about three years in Indiana, and I remember uh, at that Christian school, one of my teachers, I think it was my Bible teacher, who was also a uh, uh, preacher. He was an evangelist or something like that. I can't remember. And I remember him telling this story, and I don't know why it came up, but I said, well, he wasn't a, uh, he said something about who was Satan, what did he look like in the garden or something. I, I, he was asking that question. And I remember saying, well, he obviously was like a dragon or something. And he laughed at me and said, everybody knows a serpent is a snake. He was a snake, right? And I thought, yeah, but when he was first talking to Eve, he was obviously walking around. And then later on, it said, right. you're cursed on your belly. Right. right? Now, years later, because I just took his word for it and dismissed that and said, oh, I guess, <laughs> I, guess I had some kind of weird, weird idea. Although the Bible clearly calls Satan the, the, the uh, dragon, right? So there was this <laughs> Some kind of a relation to the dragon. And then in that verse, if you notice in chapter uh, 12 and in chapter 20, he says that, old, that dragon, that old serpent, and the devil, and Satan. And so dragon and serpent are kind of together there. You say, well, yeah, look, a dragon is different than a serpent. Now, what is a dragon? I believe dragon is not, I mean, obviously not a mythical creature. I believe it was alive on the ark. Probably there was a some sort of a dragon. Uh, you know, when they say dinosaurs, you say, oh, there's no dinosaurs in the Bible. Well, the word dinosaur wasn't around, but you know what word was around? Dragon. And I believe it was some kind of lizard-type creature, uh, you know, in fossils that we found of what we would call dinosaurs match this description. And so when the Bible talks about dinosaur or serpent, a lot of times it's the same. Also, there's uh, certain references to sea creatures that are called serpents, okay? Now, you say, well, what? Yeah, but they look completely different. I mean, what are you, do you believe evolution? I mean, because evolutionists teach that the, uh, the lizards were walking around. I t correct me if I'm wrong, you, you uh, public school uh, <laughs> graduates. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Lizards, they say, walked around for thousands of years, or, or not thousands, millions of years, right? And then they just kind of decided, hey, we don't need these legs anymore, right? And so that they got rid of the legs. Was it that way or the opposite? I think that was the way that it was. So here one day I was just, I think I was like having a conversation with a, an atheist Facebook friend. And he was telling me all these different things. And he's like, don't you know, he's trying to prove evolution to me. Don't you know that they have found these little bones on snakes where their legs used to be? And now there's these vestigial organs or whatever they used to be legs you look it up you'll see they actually have those and so a lot of creation scientists said well you see <clears throat> they weren't legs god gave those so that they could be able to do certain things and they talk about the reproduction and, and all this stuff and what they need to use these things for and the evolution say that's so stupid it's clearly they were legs have you ever looked at a lizard there are certain lizards that if you chop their arm their their legs off they look exactly like a snake <laughs> right and so, and there are some that are, uh, some snakes. You would look at it, you would say a, you'd say it's a snake, but by its scientific uh, description or whatever, it's actually a lizard. Right? Now, you say, well, where does that all come? I, I I don't I don't really know. Like I haven't studied this. I'm certainly don't believe in millions of years of evolution and all that kind of stuff. But here's what I know: the Bible calls them the same thing, so there's some kind of relationship there. And what I think happened was that in the Garden of Eden, Satan literally possessed some kind of creature, of a, like a lizard-type creature. And when God cursed him, he created a new species of this creature that was what we would call a snake. You know, I, I don't know. He's crawled on his belly from then, that point on. None of that's really important, but it makes it interesting when you're reading that and you're saying, why does it say dragon and serpent? And we know a serpent is a snake. I think there's some similarities there that... Probably even uh, uh, some a scientist today could even uh, uh, kind of point out their similarities. 
But in Genesis 3.14 there, he's cursed Satan, and he became yeah. this, uh, this, he already was called a serpent, but now he's a serpent that goes on his pillow. But it wasn't actually Satan. Satan doesn't actually walk around like a roaring lion on his belly. You know what I mean? That's not what it's talking about. This was a creature in that, uh, that existed at that time who was cursed, as we understand. Okay. So here's what we know about the devil's ambitions, and I just kind of tried to quote it. But look at 1 Peter 5. We know that from that time, Genesis 3, 14, Satan has continued to do this work. And look at chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And Satan, that's what he wants to do. His job is just to, you know, undermine God and try to destroy people and try to stop Christians from doing what they're supposed to do for the Lord. And it's very clear all throughout the Bible that was his job. Uh, we see it happening uh, on a daily basis, even in our own lives, we have to pray. Lord, just stop the workings of the devil. Don't let the devil interfere. And uh, I know it's not him necessarily physically, but his demons or whatever. And we don't want uh, him to be able to stop uh, what we're doing for the Lord. Now, this is similar to what I just mentioned about um, angels, because fallen angels, demons. Because I don't believe that Satan is uh, certainly not omnipresent. Okay, and I don't believe that he actually like just goes around and he's he's been in each one of our lives trying to tempt us and cause us to do certain things or whatever. I believe he uses demons, right, or fallen angels that he has uh, doing his work for him. And if you think about it, it's very similar to how God has his angels that carry out his missions. And whenever you see in the Bible, oftentimes the angel speaks to a man and it says, the Lord said. Makes me think also of Moses. Moses had a guy with him, his brother uh, Aaron. Oftentimes the Bible says, and Moses said, Moses said, Moses said. But when you read that, God said Aaron will be a mouthpiece. He'll be a prophet for Moses and he'll carry on the word. Well, just like God uses angels, just like Moses used Aaron, in the same way, Satan uses his demons. And so we'll see that. But, but here... In this story, we see kind of like, this is the very end for Satan. This is, he knows his time is short. He's doing as much damage as he can. And kind of like, this is his time to shine, if you will. He knows where his final destination is going to be. <clears throat> so this is, uh, this is the dragon. We understand that all throughout the Bible. This one's not that confusing. But we're going to see his tie to the beast here in a second. Look at verse 13. I mean, chapter 13, sorry, Revelation 13. So the first character that we see is the dragon. We understand who that is. Now, there are two beasts that are going to be mentioned. The first one, we're just going to call the beast. Okay, there's a name for the second one. The first one we're going to call the beast, chapter 13, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, this is John, given this vision here, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. So... In this case, the dragon, which is Satan, is giving this beast power. Okay, and you say, well, how does that happen? Well, it's 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 some interesting things going on here, and I'm certainly not going to have all the answers. But I want you to notice, first of all, this strange picture, right? This this, this description of his appearance. It says he has seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns. Now, if you back up to chapter twelve. When we were introduced to the dragon, the dragon had seven heads in verse 3, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. You say, what does all that mean? I don't know. <laughs> but books have been written 
trying to explain how this represents this and the seven, you know, uh, different things. But I don't really know. I suspect whenever it happens, you know, people will be like, oh, that's what the Bible was talking about, right? There's a lot of prophecy that we won't, we don't want to get distracted and kind of miss the whole picture because we start focusing on these little details that we really don't understand. And some people get way off in their interpretations uh, because of that. So this beast... Uh, is described this way with the with the heads and all that kind of stuff. Now, let me say something about the beast. Upon first reading, let's say you just started in Revelation and you're reading through, you come across the four beasts, which are the cherubim, and you look at that and they've got the four heads and they've got the wings and you're, you're like, whoa, we've seen this before. Back in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, uh, description exactly, pretty, pretty much exactly like that. In Isaiah 6, we saw that, the, the, the seraphim in that case, right, with the six wings, but they look very similar. And throughout the Bible, we see this interesting creature. As we're reading through Revelation, we get to, uh, I think it's chapter 4, and he's got this heavenly vision, and he sees these beasts, and he gives us these different things. Up until this point, we've been pretty literal. We've taken a literal, literal approach. And uh, like I've said before, when you're reading the Bible, the first thing you should do is just take it literally, just like it says. Now, typically, if there's some kind of symbolism involved, the Bible's going to explain that. Okay, for instance, the 12 stars, you know, are the 12 churches, or I mean, are the 12 angels of the churches, right? The 12 uh, uh, candlesticks are the 12 churches. It, it, it gives you that description. So as you're looking at that, uh, you're saying, uh, I said, I meant seven candlesticks. As you're looking at that, it gives you a description. Now, when it talks about these seven heads, and all that kind of stuff, at first you don't see that. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, this is a real beast. I'm, as an artist, thinking, how could I draw that, right? Seven heads, and how does it have ten horns? Is it like uh, on, you know, <laughs> if, there's, if there's seven heads, you can't divide evenly <laughs> ten horns on all their heads. So how does that how does that work? And man, I don't know, are they like antlers, you know, a ten-point buck, right? It's got this ten... Ten horns. I don't know. So I'm trying to think about how this works out. And I'm thinking, is this a literal creature that's going to rise up out of the sea and it's going to go do all these things that we see in Revelation? Right? And since we've already taken a little approach on the cherubim and all that, you would say, huh, maybe that's just what it looks like. Until we get down the road a little bit uh, in chapter 17. Let's first go to Daniel, though. Daniel chapter 7. We obviously know that sometimes in prophecy there are these very strange pictures that represent something. Most of the time, in fact. And usually there's an explanation. Like, for instance, Jacob's dreams. I mean, Joseph's dreams. He has these dreams and then it explains what those dreams mean. Look at Daniel 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head uh, of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came out uh, came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion. And had eagle's wings, I beheld till the wings there were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and the man's heart was given it to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself uh, one uh, on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth, uh, of it between the teeth of it. And they said, uh, thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard. See a lot of actually similarities between what we just read in Revelation, right? A lot of certain, the leopard and the bear, and we see some of these things. Okay? Which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in a night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. I consider the ten horns. And behold, there came up uh, among them a little horn. Uh, behold, whom there, uh, whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, it was a horn. Uh, behold, in this horn 
were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. If you're an artist, that would be a neat drawing to draw as well, okay? <laughs> and so we see here this, these weird descriptions of these different beasts and everything. And what's interesting is having just read about Nebuchadnezzar, the, the, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had and the statue, you know, with the, the golden head and then it goes down and if you line that up with this, you're like, okay, he must be talking about the same thing. These are representing different nations that are coming up. Now go back to Revelation and look at verse uh, chapter 17. Now, if you keep on reading, we're, we're not here yet, obviously, but just because we're talking about the beast, you get to chapter 17, and look at verse 3. Uh, let me see here. Let's back up so you get an idea what's going on. Uh, 17. What was I doing? Uh, 17. Yeah, okay. We gotta go. We gotta read a little bit here. And how much do I want to read? Okay, let's just read. And it came. Uh, to, uh, and there came. This is chapter 17, verse one. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. We we're not talking about this yet. And talked with me, saying unto me, Come up hither. I'll sh come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the king of the earth hath committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon, watch this, a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, that sounds familiar, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color uh, and decked with gold. Now it talks about the woman for a little bit, okay? And then it talks about the great uh, mystery of Babylon, the great mother of harlots. And, and so it's talking about this woman, and then it comes back. Let me see here. Verse, uh, let's go with 10. Uh, no, no, 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now, I'm not going to explain all this now, because we're not in chapter 17 yet. But what I want to show you is that, do you see it here now? Okay, so there must be some symbolism in this, because he actually explained that there's kingdoms, you know, these are seven mountains, and all that. Okay, now let's go back to chapter 13. <clears throat> Alright, so we know who the dragon is, and according to this, the dragon gives this beast power. <clears throat> now, the Bible actually never says the, word, the phrase, the Antichrist. Okay? <laughs> I think I mentioned that once before. Some people kind of looked at me funny, like, are you kidding me? The Bible says the Antichrist a lot of times. It never says the Antichrist. Okay, the Bible says, look, at, uh, in 1 John, we won't go there, but in 1 John it says, as I have told you, Antichrist cometh. It says, and there are many Antichrists, okay? Now, I'm not saying there isn't a guy that we refer to as the Antichrist, but the Bible refers to it as the beast, Okay, so this beast that we're talking about here in chapter 13 is referring to the Antichrist, and I'll show you that here in the conclusion of this, but, uh, but the idea here is that this beast, and there's all these kingdoms mentioned, I'm not going to speculate what the kingdoms are and where this beast is going to come out of and who's going to give them the authority. Okay, that's not my objective to, to this afternoon, but what I wanted to show you is that there is this beast that's going to arise that the Bible's talking about. And this is who we call the Antichrist oftentimes, okay? And the Bible just refers to him as the beast right here. Now, yeah, the Bible talks about, hey, there's going to be a man revealed, the man of sin, son of perdition. You've heard all these words talking about the same person. The Bible here calls him a beast, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. It's like, I don't even want to call this guy a man. <laughs> He's a beast, right? And Satan gives him his power, you know. And the Bible actually does talk about beasts a lot of times. I mean, think of Nebuchadnezzar, right? He was made to be like a beast. Ecclesiastes talks about the man being as a beast, okay? If he's not got the spirit of the Lord in him, 
And so this beast is the Antichrist. And the third person we're going to talk about is what's called the second beast. Back to chapter 13, look at verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Again, I'm not going to explain what all the symbolism is because I just don't know. Uh, and I don't think it's necessarily important for the way that we're approaching this. Verse 12, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, they should make an image to the beast uh, which hath the wound by a sword uh, and did live. Uh, so the idea here, and we're going to see this more later, but the idea is that this person uh, that we're talking about is somehow killed, right? And then is resurrected, apparently. It looks like he's resurrected. He was dead, and now he lives again. You're going to see a lot of reference to this. And uh, this causes everybody to want to worship this beast or this person, if you will. And, uh, and it's interesting, uh, as we're talking about this other beast, right? And he's causing everybody to want to worship this first beast. And so what you notice is he's pointing men to this beast, right? In other words, he's preaching this beast praises. He's preaching that this is the one you need to worship and let's set up a statue and all that. And so can you kind of see where this is that character that we call the false prophet? The Bible talks about the beast and the false prophet. It's talking about this beast and the second beast, okay? So right here we got the dragon, we got the beast, and now we have the false prophet. Okay, this false prophet is going to be doing all these miracles and all this. Now, this is what I always go back to when somebody is talking to me about how today we should look for the signs and the wonders. Okay, because this is what the charismatic movement has said, is they're going back to the age of the apostles. And they're saying, you know, we're apostolic. We, have the, we are returning to these gifts that God gave the, the apostles even though Christianity as a whole realized that those had been done away with for many years, and they're saying, oh, we're going back. This starts back in the early 1900s with the uh, Azusa Street revivals, and, and these guys were fasting and praying and all that, and then they claimed that they had the sudden ability to do these signs and these wonders. And now if you talk to anybody involved in that, they'll say, hey, there's a spreading. In fact, I overheard someone talking about this this morning to someone, and they're saying it's spreading, and there's people all over that are prophesying. And they're saying that this is going to happen and that's going to happen and there's going to be many signs and wonders. And I'm thinking, don't you understand? Here's the only thing that we know from this point on to the end of our history on this earth is that there's going to be somebody that's going to come and he's going to have signs and wonders and he's going to deceive people. Yep. So why should I be looking for, you know, a verification that I have the Holy Spirit by signs and wonders? Well, because in the book of Acts, yeah, but we're not living in the book of Acts right now. All those things happen. I believe they all happen. I have the word of God. I can believe the word of God. I don't need signs and wonders. In fact, the word of God Amen. says there's going to be some signs and wonders that are going to deceive people. And so we don't want to be uh, deceived. So this false prophet, again, the Bible says there are many antichrists. There are many false prophets. Now, I do believe there's going to be this final antichrist, and there's going to be this final false prophet uh, right before, you know, this great tribulation that we're talking about. But up until that time, there's been many of them, okay? <laughs> and there are world leaders that are simply being empowered by Satan. And they're, and they're presenting themselves to be spiritual leaders. Uh, you know, they have what, what we read in the Old Testament about this evil spirit or this lying spirit that comes from God even. He, he allows them to have these lying spirits and to proclaim these. They're gonna be, there's going to be a strong delusion, the Bible says. And many people are going to be deceived by this false prophet and by the beast and by these signs and wonders. <laughs> Speaking of false prophets, 
There's a lot of uh, people making prophecies right now. Have you noticed that? A lot of spiritual leaders in the charismatic movement making prophecies. Most of them right now about how Trump's going to be reelected. Don't you forget, you know, uh, don't you, what is a, uh, man, I can't remember some of the memes that I've seen where people are saying, and you know what, maybe he will, but here's what I'm thinking. Let's say he doesn't. Okay, because the 99% of 99.9% .9 of anything that you see out there is saying, no, Biden won the election, right? And now you've got all these Christian prophets or prophetesses, most of them, <laughs> and they're all saying, I saw a revelation and I know what's going to happen now. And forget, you know, I know that they are saying that Biden, you know, is won, but actually Trump won. Let's say that never comes to pass. What does the Bible say is supposed to happen to false prophets when they <laughs> say that God gave me a vision and this is what happens and then that doesn't happen? Put to death. They're supposed to be put to death right. <laughs> according to the Bible, right? You, that's why you just don't make flippant prophecies and say, oh, God gave me a special revelation. No, no, no. I'm not going to ever tell anybody that. Uh, you know, even if I had one, I probably would be very uh, slow to, uh, to ever say something like that, okay? Now let's close this with some some other verses from the Bible that talk about this event. And the first one I'm gonna look at is the first half of Revelation, because remember, in, in one way or another, you know, if I'm right about this division in chapter 12, this should have already been talked about to some degree, right? So let's go to chapter six, Revelation six, and read this again. See if it matches up a little bit with what we see in chapter 13. All right, starting in verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And uh, you read down all through all these seals, and you see, uh, you know, a lot of war, famine, destruction, and all that. Okay, look at, uh, let's see, uh, Let's just finish with verse 8, because that's kind of the end of those first four seals. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Okay, so he's got this power that was given to them to destroy and to conquer. What do we see in chapter 13? The beast comes out, and power is given to him. Right to uh, to to go into war and to kill and conquer. All right, uh, let me see here. Let's go to Matthew now. Matthew 24. I told you we're going to go to Matthew 24 almost every uh, sermon, probably, because Jesus already gave in a nutshell all these events that were going to happen. And when we read Revelation, it's like, oh man, it's lining up exactly like what Jesus said was going to happen. So Revelation, I mean not Revelation, Matthew chapter 24. Uh, Matthew 24, look at verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars. Now look, there's a long time before, between this prophecy and the time that John's talking about in Revelation. Quite a long, quite a long time has passed, right? Because it hasn't even happened yet. So over 2,000 years for sure. And uh, all this has happened. And he's saying, hey, between this time and that time, there's going to be many false Christs. And there's going to be many false prophets, okay? But it's all going to lead up to that final one for sure. And many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places, and these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And uh, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Okay, so all this uh, uh, is talking in 15. It talks about the uh, 
abomination of desolation, and which is kind of like that midpoint where the idols are being set up, you know, to the beast. And we, we read about that, okay? And so that's right where we are in chapter 13. Again, now we've already discussed in chapter 6 the resurrection and then the judgment, the, the, uh, the wrath of God being poured out on men. We're reading this again, right? Chapter 12 started back with Christ, and then in verse 5, he's caught up to heaven, and then all of a sudden the dragon is persecuting the woman and all that. So we're seeing this all over again. And now what we're seeing with this beast that's rising up and the devil's giving him power, and then there's a false prophet, I believe that Christians are still there, okay? Until that midpoint when things are really, really point, really, really tough. And at that point, the, uh, the uh, rapture happens, which means to some degree, we're going to see this beast rise up <laughs> into power. And we're going to see uh, these certain things begin to happen. These are the beginning of trials, okay? And so, you know, the main thing is that we as Christians shouldn't be deceived. In fact, the Bible says if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect, right? We're not going to be deceived because we believe in the, we believe in Christ. We're not going to receive a mark of the beast or anything like that if we're uh, following the Lord. And thankfully, we know that the days of rapture is coming before the wrath is poured out. So, in conclusion, I just, I think it's really strange that we have these three characters, and I, and I can't help but think about this. So you have the dragon, that's the devil. You have this beast that rises up, who's a man. It comes out of nowhere, apparently, right? I don't know this, the whole story behind it, but there's this man with great power and all this, that the beast gives him power. And then you have this false prophet that's pointing everybody to worship the beast. And I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, that's kind of like a trinity. <laughs> right? It's like a false trinity you've got uh, going on there. And now I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like the, the, the you know, you're familiar with the whole yin-yang thing, like the Eastern religions believe, well, like, like there is no good and there's evil. It's just like one and the same. And I'll, obviously, I don't believe that, okay? But remember, I said there's two evil powers at work. <laughs> I mean, not two evil powers. There's two forces at work. And I'm not sound a little Star Warsy there. Right? <laughs> There's the dark side. And the <laughs> no, but there are two powers, at, 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 two forces at work in heaven and on earth. The thing is, we understand who's going to win in the end. We understand that the, the dark side has no chance in the end. So I'm not going to live my life worried about these kinds of things. I'm not going to worry about uh, what's going to happen in that time. Let, uh, let me see here. Uh, let's go things getting mixed up here I'm thinking about the message I'm going to preach and I don't know what <laughs> okay so never mind what I was just fixing to say okay. so, uh, so the fact that anybody is going to fall for the deception and anybody would ever like just follow this, this I mean they they it's, it's completely wrong, but they have movies about the end times, right? They have movies about the beast. They have movies about being left behind and all these kind of things. Again, that's bad doctrine. A lot of that stuff is wrong. But I kind of wonder, like, how is the world going to fall for this? How are they going to fall for this Antichrist and this world leader that's trying to unite everybody and, uh, and bring everybody together and, and form this one world, you know, and then all of a sudden they're seeing, like, Christians being persecuted, and how does anybody, how are they deceived by that? And I wonder about that. The signs and the wonders and all that, somehow they see it all, and they're just like, they're falling for it, and they're just wrapped up in it, and they, and, 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 and we as Christians are thinking, like, how can you be so blinded? How could you fall for these kind of things? But then I think about what people are already falling for now. <laughs> I mean, quite honestly, I cannot wrap my mind around why anybody would want to be we want to even lean toward socialism, communism, right? Does not history, you know, has not history shown you what's going to happen if we embrace socialism and communism? I can't understand. And yet a big portion, maybe majority of our country right now is like, oh, no, socialism is the way to go. And, oh, we need socialized medicine. And we need this and we need that. And it's like, ah, they're falling for it. Why? Television, media. False prophets. I mean, I'm not. 
you know, I'm not trying to make that, that a, a spiritual thing, but I'm just saying people are so easily deceived, it seems like. So as a Christian, don't be so easily deceived. You know, just understand that, uh, that there are things that are going to happen, and there's a lot of wickedness out there. There are evil forces at play, and they are deceiving people. I was talking about uh, earlier before the service, I was talking about atheism. Lord willing, this Thursday I'm going to preach on uh, uh, willing, being willingly ignorant, okay, which we talk about science falsely so-called, and the absurdity of some of the things that they will be willing to believe. And what always goes through my mind is when they found uh, uh, dinosaur, they were checking out dinosaurs' bones, and they looked at it, and they found soft tissue, right? It just blew their mind because there's like soft tissue in a dinosaur bone. Like, I mean, well, I, 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 we had no idea. I mean, there's no way there could be soft tissue. And by soft, that's not like, not like brand new, like yesterday, but, but relatively soft. Soft, according to their calculations, it should never have been that way. And instead of saying like, "Whoa, maybe we're wrong about 64 million years ago that the dinosaurs were extinct," <laughs> instead of saying that, they say, "Well, this changes everything that we know." about how the bones can be preserved over years. <laughs> it's like they'll willingly like believe anything that they can grasp onto. And so I read these two articles recently, I'll mention them on Thursday, uh, about how these different animals got to different parts, of the, to different continents, you know? And so there's, there's these absurd beliefs that, well, apparently, you know, these, these animals just kind of rode over on logs or on boats or you know, surfboards or something like that. And that's how they, they got there. And I'll read a couple articles to you, some sections of some articles, and it's like, why is it that they'll believe that? You know, one guy that the atheists hold up to be a very smart guy, Richard Dawkins, he says, uh, he says, well, it could be that a higher life form created us and put us here. And what he's talking about is aliens. Stupid. And he's like, I can believe that, but I can't believe that the God of the Bible exists. Right? They are just willingly <laughs> ignorant and so easily deceived because that's what happens when your eyes are blinded because you rejected Christ. Right. And so we are going to preach the gospel and just hope to <laughs> open up some eyes and some minds to receive the Lord. That's all we can do in these last days. All right. And though we got to make sure we're not deceived ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. <clears throat> Many things prophesied. We don't understand uh, exactly what they're going to look like, but we have faith and we understand uh, the Bible to be uh, true and relevant. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to uh, not be fooled by false prophets and those would, that would uh, uh, give the appearance that they're the ministers of light. We understand that the devil can do that. And help us, Lord, to rely on your word and uh, as our final authority. Uh, and, and not to be deceived by the, the philosophies and the thinking of the world and uh, help us just to do the best that we can to live right, live holy for you and to be uh, good stewards of what you give us and to boldly proclaim your word to everybody. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.